<laughs> All right, let me uh, just get started with a quick introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Morgan McLeod uh, here today. Uh, Morgan, uh, he got his PhD at UC Santa Cruz and has been in at Princeton, been an Einstein fellow, is, is now an IC fellow at Harvard. Um, we were really excited to invite uh, Morgan here because uh, um, this is showing going my age. I remember when I was just a graduate or like, like an undergrad, where we talk about this thing called the common envelope. And, and we'd see all these exotic binary, uh, exotic systems on one hand, and then we see these binary stellar systems you know, on the other hand, and we'd, we'd say, okay, some magic that happens in between, some fairies that, that suddenly so somehow <laughs> convert these binaries into these exotic systems. Um, and it's just been amazing over the last, the last few decades, seeing how both observations and theory really working in concert have uh, really elucidated this picture. So we were to, you know, have yeah. Morgan here to, to give us an update on this. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And, and um... I think that's you know exactly what I'm hoping hoping to talk about a couple of examples of, and so I'm going to talk about star mergers and common envelope phases as seen in the transient night sky, and what we're learning, especially from. Uh, I think a theme of this talk will be that you know every, every time we get new data, we have basically a, a whole set of questions that we don't understand, or a new set of observations that we don't understand, and then I think. Basically, by going through that, that iteration of trying to model those new observations in each sort of layer where we're understanding more and more about these objects. Um, so to set, uh, there we go, to set the stage for that, um, this is a single star. And then um, this is my best version of planets. So we have some planets around. And there's, there's at least two, as you can see there. Um, but there's also binary, binary stars. stars. Some stellar systems have a pair of stars on a similar sort of size scale to our inner solar system. Um, some have uh, pairs of stars which are very di different in their properties. Um, one might be, be much more massive, or one, one might be more compact. Um, there are triples and higher or multiples in different uh, hierarchies and configurations. And the thing that I think is amazing about this is that those systems are, in a sense, feel very foreign because we have this prototype of our own solar system. We open the sky, we see one sun, but, but that's a relatively common configuration. So uh, at one solar mass, more than half of stars are single, about 60%, but that means that 40% are in binary or multiple solar systems. And as, as you go up, in mass, by the time you get to 10 or 20 solar masses, uh, almost, almost all, like 90% of stars are in multiple systems. And so understanding how those multiple systems change the evolution of those stars becomes a very central part of understanding the story of those stars' evolution. Sorry, but there's been some issues. Okay, okay. So when you can turn off video off of your, uh... Here, here. Yes. And then if you can uh, turn on off your mic on the 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 bottom, hold it. So try talking. Online. How does that end online? Oh, okay, fantastic. I'm gonna try putting it back on my shirt. My shirt and stop me again, and if that becomes a giant problem. Um, okay. So uh, we have these multiple systems. There seems to be a critical part part of understanding stellar evolution. Um, what might that that look like? So. Uh, this is sort of uh, the cartoon picture uh, Tony was alluding to. We, we start with a pair of stars. They might evolve for a few billion years. 
as stars evolve, they of course change in radius. One of them gets bigger, it starts to interact with its companion directly, and then, then be over the course of a few days, they could, could merge together into a single uh, big, bigger star. And that process of merger, we sometimes call a common envelope phase, and I'll come to the reason why. But the big picture is that you have a system and it's, it's evolving into contact. And by default, this means that uh, the radius of the star is growing and, and causing them to interact. It can also mean that if they're in a triple system, for example, there could, could be some uh, torques on the inner pair in that binary system that's driving them into contact for a reason and that's related to sort of their orbital evolution rather than stellar evolution. Um, then when basically the envelope of the more extended star reaches the separation of the more compact object, sort of like a satellite that, that comes into Earth's atmosphere, it starts spiraling closer and closer through, through the material. And as it, it does, it falls into denser and denser material. And so the process accelerates. Um, and then one of two things can happen. Um, if, like in satellite case, the satellite falling through Earth's atmosphere doesn't inject enough energy or, or heat into Earth's atmosphere to evaporate it, which is good. Um, but uh, that means that the satellite keeps falling through the atmosphere and eventually like crashes to the surface uh, somewhere. Now, the equivalent of that is that the binary merges and you have a single object um, coming, coming out to the other side. Um, the other thing that can happen is if, if this air of the stellar core and the more compact companion um, are, are orbiting so vigorously enough in their surroundings, they can start to throw out that, that material around them and grow out their surroundings and leave behind a binary that's been really transformed by that process. Something else we're learning is that this step right here from a separate system to one that, that sort of in this shared configuration is not entirely gentle. And so, so uh, some material is shock heated, it's thrown out, and we can see the optical and maybe infrared transients from that. And from uh, so dissecting everything that we're seeing, we're actually learning a tremendous amount. And that's going to be the focus of uh, what I'm hoping to talk to you about uh, today. So I'll talk to you first about this class of observations, then uh, a little bit about a couple uh, really interesting characteristics of them, and then we're how modeling that and trying to uh, really sort of understand what's going on. Are, are you sure? I'm sorry, we're going to yeah. try one more thing. Just turn the mic off and then turn it off on your computer. Is it better if I have it not on my, my shirt, for example? I'm not sure. I thought that was something I was worried about, but because uh, so I can just hold it. Yeah, I can do that for now. Now, whatever. Yeah, just feel free to stop me. Okay. Okay. Um, okay so, uh, as um, the big picture is that uh, some hot ejecta are thrown out of the system. They radiate as they expand, become transparent, and cool. And you might have some transition that this little sentence basically increases in brightness as these ejecta expand and then reaches some peak, starts to decay as their air become transparent and older. Um, we got a great indication that this process might be happening um, from a transient V1309 Scorpius. And so I love this plot, um, even though it's in German. Um, and, and there's a lot going on because it's all sort of in one place. Like, so on the right hand side is the orbital period of the binary and it corresponds to these orange lines. And what this shows you is that over, um, over this time period from around 1001 to 2009, uh, the orbital period of the system was de decreasing from about 1.44 days down to around 1.4 days. And if you sort of extrapolate like, this trend of decreasing orbit, out the other side, there was a 10 magnitude layer of the system. And, and 
uh, this object was in the Ogle microlensing data set. And when people zoomed back in on this portion of the light, light curve, they, they found that it was actually an eclipsing binary. And so that's what, what let you make, make the measurements. And, and out the, the other side, there's no variability that would indicate that it's a binary. And so the indication was that this, the system had started it out as separate stars and merged into one. Um, yeah. Okay, there, there we go. Uh, so that should be, that should be with my computer audit. Okay, um, and I'll try not to wander off too far. Um, <laughs> um, so, okay, so that object ended up serving as kind of a prototype for a class of objects, which is now growing really rapidly. Um, and it's called the luminous red Novi. Um, I looked it up. There's also, there was like a San Francisco garage band called the Luminous Red Novi. Um, apparently they had stickers, um, but this was like back in 2002 or something and I haven't been able to get one. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you ever see them in concert, you should go uh, because they're a particularly spectacular class of objects. And so they're between um, classical Novi and core collapse supernovae and brightness. They have similar durations of tens to hundreds of days. Um, and what we're learning is that the first few objects were identified by their similarity to this sort of prototype B1309 Scorpius. And this was really kind of an empirically defined class, but just like binaries come in all different configurations, maybe these transients have a brighter range of properties as well. Um, so, there are somewhere between eight and maybe 13 uh, transients that have both, um, sorry, I was wandering off, uh, uh, pre-outburst detections of a progenitor and a known distance and um, observations of the outburst itself. So, these are the objects that form like an especially uh, sort of helpful core because we can connect um, the properties of the outburst to the sort of system that gave rise to them. And that's really kind of at the root of what we're trying to do. We're trying to map systems through this phase. So as Tony was saying, we've always seen the before and the after, but we never knew which systems connected to which after. And so we're trying to watch uh, systems go from some binary system map to a certain transient outburst and then emerge on the other side with some set of properties. And if we understand that mapping in detail, that would be really kind of an amazing accomplishment. So the properties of these systems, they have this wide range of luminosities, timescales of sort of broadly months, um, really wide range of masses and radii of the progenitor stars involved, um, a less broad range of effective temperatures. So all except for maybe one of these sources are in the sort of five to 8,000 Kelvin um, range. And uh, then a pretty broad range of ejective velocities, but all of them sort of slower than supernovae, for example. And some interesting trends emerge if you just make scatter plots of these eight objects on every different axis. Um, and so uh, I made a table of these and that's a little bit of what I spent my last couple of weeks doing. Um, <laughs> but here's one example. And um, this was pointed out earlier on a smaller set of data, but it seems to be that among these transients, the luminosity, um, uh, seems to scale as roughly the third power of the mass. And what that means is that if you think about the initial mass function scaling with some strong negative power of the mass, something like m to the minus 2.5, say, if the luminosity of these sources opposes that, and we're looking for extra galactic transients and we're in a flux limited context, then we basically don't have a bias on what masses these sources end up having because those two power laws cancel each other out into a relatively flat distribution. 
And I think that's borne out. But so if you look at the x-axis here, there's a pretty even scattering of one to 30 solar mass progenitors among these objects. And so uh, I think that's kind of special because it seems to be one of the only cases in which, you know, massive stars, which have these rare, amazing outcomes, uh, aren't actually kind of underrepresented in our sample here, as opposed to uh, the lower mass systems. And I guess that's kind of like sort of supernovae or something like that, where these massive systems give you really bright uh, outbursts. So let's start talking about some of the particular objects themselves. So uh, turning to uh, Andromeda, if we zoom in on this little corner here, um, you can see where it's marked in red, there's a source brightening. This is over uh, the very end of uh, 2014 and the beginning of 2015. Um, so this source uh, brightened to about maybe 15th or 16th magnitude. Um, and what was really interesting was this was one of the first times where there was, uh, this source was extra galactic. And so uh, many of the previous objects have been galactic. And so all of a sudden, you know the distance and there happened to be HST imaging of this field um, in a few different colors. And so we could connect the, binary system that produced this outburst, or at least the primary star in that binary system, so the brighter of the two stars, um, to the outburst that it produced. And so here's the outburst, um, the red in luminous red novae. Luminous is more luminous than classical novae. Red is that the blue declines much faster than the sort of uh, red and infrared colors here. Um, and What's going on there is that we're just seeing the uh, sort of cooling emission of shock heated gas. There's no additional heat source that's keeping that gas at a certain temperature. So as it expands, it gets cooler and the color gets redder and redder. Now, what's kind of interesting about this light curve is if you look at that rise, it's really steep. And it's actually, it's about eight days. That's pretty similar to the orbital period of a test mass around the surface of that, you know, several solar mass, 30 solar radius star. And at face value, that's kind of surprising. Um, and we can talk about why. Uh, the other thing, and I'm showing you actually a different object here, which has a little bit more cleanly sampled data, but all of these seem to show some sort of phase of extended kind of precursor brightening. So they sort of slowly brighten. And then at some point at the very end, uh, they are like rising to their peak brightness in a, a timescale of order and orbital period. So my question from this is, how does a binary that's stable for like a stellar evolutionary lifetime, be that millions or billions of years, end up merging in a single orbit? So this process of stellar evolution into contact we think should be very gradual. And so what is it that gives us this rapidity that makes these astronomical transients rather than say something that takes 100,000 years? Um, and at face value, I don't think that's ob obvious. And so um, we put some effort into modeling that process. And I'm not gonna talk a ton about the details of the setup, but. Um, I'm using a hydrodynamics code called Athena++. And the basic geometry of the system is that we are modeling the interaction of the gaseous envelope of the primary or donor star in the binary system uh, with two point masses. And those represent the other objects in the system. And so obviously that's an approximation, but it's a useful one for the kind of level. There's still a lot to learn from that. I guess I'll say. Um, so in this case, uh, they start out separated by the separation at which mass transfer starts uh, that we'll call the Roche limit separation. Um, they're set up in kind of dimensionless units where the uh, total mass is, uh, the, the mass of the donor is one and the mass uh, of the accretor is set by the mass ratio and then we're modeling the gas that makes up that envelope of the donor star. Okay, and 
Here, we're looking at a slice through the orbital plane in one of those simulations. And so wiggling around there in the center is the binary system. And you can see material is streaming from the donor star toward the accretor, the smaller one that's going around the outside. And it's being kind of cast off into those surroundings. And at the end, it's just sort of going along. And at the end, it's going to go faster and faster. And then there's sort of a, it slows down by a factor of 10, the movie does. Um, so that's the sort of um, slow motion highlight reel. So if we look at this in the frame that co-rotates with the instantaneous orbital velocity, we take out that sort of overall orbital motion and you can see kind of how the morphology of the gas flow is transforming a little bit. So here, um, I think of this as kind of the very classic Rochelob overflow geometry where you have this thin stream of material transferring. Um, it's actually piling up in our simulation. We don't let it accrete. In reality, it piles up much faster than the accreting object can accept. And so it streams away in these spiral arms from the inner binary and sort of piles up in the circumbinary environment. Morgan? Yeah. During the whole phase, why doesn't the semi-major axis evolve very much? Is it just not very much mass that's uh, transferring here? Yeah, so it starts out really, really slow. And so the blue line is where it started. And basically only at the very end does that evolution become rapid. Um, and, and, and that's kind of at the root of what we're seeing. And so basically here, it's almost impossible to see, but the semi-major axis is shrinking ever so slightly. Um, and you're interacting essentially with the outermost layers of the star. And what happens is that as the separation decreases just a little bit, then uh, the material that's overflowing the Roche lobe comes from deeper in the star where it's denser. And the scale height at the surface of the star is really small. And so it's this steep gradient of density. And so as you go in a little bit, you carve into exponentially higher densities and you get uh, this kind of runaway mass exchange. And at the end here, the morphology is really different. So you have this broad fan of ejecta, it's running into everything else that was ejected earlier. It's velocity, it's sort of radial velocities are actually higher. Um, but uh, overall, if we look at this in time, so this is time in dynamical time, separation in radii of the donor star, uh, you have this process that starts out gradual and becomes very fast. Does the fact that it, um happens so quickly also depend on the polytropic index of the envelope. Um, if it's convective, maybe it reacts in a different way than if it's radiative. Yeah, so um, one thing that matters basically, the, the thing that matters most is the degree to which the star overflows its Roche lobe and then essentially the mass in those layers that are overflowing. And so, there's like a unit change in the binary system per mass that's exchanged. But if those uh, outermost regions are extremely low density, as in a radiative envelope, then the holes, this kind of like normalization of the evolution rate is much slower. And um, then there's the fact that different stellar structures um, respond differently to that mass loss both adiabatically and if they have time to thermally adjust then sort of in thermodynamic equilibrium. And so then um, you can be in a situation where basically the mass radius relation of the donor becomes very important in determining the sort of rate of evolution. Um, but, uh, there's a breaking point between sort of stable and unstable. And if you're in the unstable branch, what you always have is exponentiating behavior. And so at a given separation, the rate will be different because the stellar structure is different, but it'll still actually have those kind of self-similar shape. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So if it's all, um, Picture it like the mass is going to be smoothly transferred from the donor side. Yeah. Um, or, but it seems like, you know, it's kind of trickling 
and the, like I'm dealing with the like recent the breaking book. And yeah. So I was wondering if there's like a similar message that shared from the donor and it kind of happens to catch but it's like the the receiving person immediately like gets a large sample. Yeah. Like, would it like immediately ship get closer or or would it be better? Yeah, and I think, for example, if the donor star were like pulsating, so you, that you got like a pulse of mass, it would like immediately pull it closer dur during that phase, and then maybe re, re sort of settle in for a while while the mass exchange rate was lower. And yeah, yeah. Um, so that definitely happens. Um, and and sometimes you have. Um, I think this will be a helpful picture to talk about that, but. Um, Sometimes you have really wonky situations that I can show you later where there's a tide and it's like interacting with the other object. And so as you pass like a wave crest of that tide, you can get more rapid mass transfer and the separation like shrinks a lot. And then you go through a trough and you, um, so there's interactions of like waves on the star with that give you exactly that behavior. Um, so, okay, what do we have here? Um, this is the uh, torque that that gas is applying to the binary system. So material, this binary is rotating like this, like the right-hand rule is pointing out of the board. And um, so material that's green is kind of leading and its gravitational interaction with those two point mass cores is to um, pull the binary sort of forward along in its orbit. And, the pink material is dragging it back. And something that you see is that the degree of asymmetry really changes. And so um, it was very symmetric early on in that kind of trickling phase. And it's very asymmetric here. And that affects the, um, the sort of relative rate of in spiral. And basically most of that asymmetry is about the accretor. And so what we see is that the donor star interior structure is relatively unchanged, but the structure around the more compact object that's spiraling in gives most of the net torque on the system that drives them together and accelerates that process. So if we come back to this picture, during this trickling phase, we basically have a trickling of material into the circumbinary surroundings. And most of that um, material uh, is coming up very slowly. So here it is on a linear scale in separation and mass loss rate. And when you have basically the, in those very last say orbital period, 90% of the mass loss is happening like as these things are coming together. And so, First of all, that mass loss is coupled to the rate of orbital decay. And second of all, it um, exponentiates so dramatically at the end that we think that's related to this phenomena of those impulsive outbursts. V1309 Scorpius ended up being a really helpful object here also. So um, this is the, uh, in this plot on the left, you're seeing, um, the eclipsing binary light curve in the years leading up to the outburst. And basically it started like a really classic contact eclipsing binary and it changed into this really wonky kind of like wave. Um, and one way to understand that is if basically there's some obscuration from an outflow surrounding the system. Um, and so uh, Andre Pesha did some modeling and, and basically we can actually get a pretty good picture of that. Um, and so uh, if basically we model that coupled mass loss and orbital decay, you can match in concert the decay of the orbital period and the increasing mass transfer rate. So these blue dots are the best fit to that sort of obscuration model. And it's not a perfect fit, but I think it's pretty good given the number of uncertainties here. And so the basic picture is that as we lead into these uh, events, there's a bunch of mass loss that's piling up in the environment around the binary. Um, a lot of the early mass loss, so here we're looking in separation. So this is the early mass transfer 
And this is as the objects come together. So the separation is equal to the donor star radius. Um, the cumulative amount of mass loss is basically just linear with the separation. Um, that is equivalent to saying that there's a constant specific angular momentum being lost. Um, and what I wanted to show you here is that most of the early mass loss is actually bound to the binary. And then only later as they're coming together are there unbound ejecta. And so that interaction ends up being really important. So you have uh, early kind of trickling off of material that's piling up in the surroundings. And then later uh, this like dense fan of faster uh, ejecta ends up uh, being thrown out, but also running into everything else that's uh, piled up all around. Um, and that leaves a bunch of interesting signatures. Um, so yeah, maybe if we have questions about that, I'm going to sort of take that and shift gears a tiny bit um, for the rest. But if you have questions right now, I can answer some, or we can keep going. So. We have this circumbinary material, and um, the we I've been showing you slices in the plane of the orbit. If I slice perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, what we see is that there's a really thick torus, and it's sort of uh, filled with all of these uh, shock structures that come from the fact that you have this spiral motion that's uh, trailing material off, and so. What ends up being actually a pretty uh, successful, really simple model for that torus distribution is a torus of constant specific angular momentum uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium. And so what that means is that uh, uh, all of the material in the torus has the same specific angular momentum. It wasn't all expelled with the same specific angular momentum. But those internal shocks you saw in that flow end up being really important for redistributing angular momentum and determining the torus uh, sort of thermal evolution. And so um, the other important ingredient of that torus model is a uh, polytropic equation of state. And it actually ends up being a different uh, index than the adiabatic uh, index of this gas in the simulation. And it ends up being that basically those shocks uh, heat up the gas at successive radii and, and so are both important in the thermal evolution and in the uh, uh, sort of angular momentum shaping of the material. So if I sliced, say, along the equator, and that's what rho of r0 in, say, like rz coordinates means, um, I get that the density in the bulk of this torus, it has like exponential cutoffs on the inner and outer sides, is something like r to the minus three. And all I wanna point out from that is that that's steeper than a steady wind away from a binary, which would be r to the minus two. And the reason that it's steeper is because you have this exponentiating mass loss. And so at late times, um, there's much more mass rich ejecta than at early times. And to the extent to which the outer parts map to the material that was lost first, um, they end up piling up into this distribution that's uh, pretty steep. And then the temperature scales as something like uh, one over the radius, and that's um, proportional to the gravitational potential. And that kind of comes from that picture where internal shocks are really important in that in that messy flow. And that's in large part because this material is bound. So the fact that it isn't escaping to infinity means that it's guaranteed to run into whatever comes out next. The other thing that can happen is that uh, dust can, can denote. So um, if these ejecta get down to about a thousand Kelvin, so they're cooling off as they expand, um, they go through a couple important transitions. One is where uh, the material recombines from ionized to atomic, that changes the opacity a lot, it decreases it a lot. Um, uh, the, then molecules form at a couple thousand Kelvin and at a around a thousand Kelvin dust starts to form. 
And to give you a sense of what that means for the opacity, um, dust grains are very opaque and their exact opacity depends on the wavelength and the size distribution and a number of things. Um, but of course, not all of the mass can be dust grains because there's a lot of hydrogen and helium and light elements. And so if a mass fraction of uh, around 10 to the minus three of the gas ends up in dust grains, then the opacity is sort of on the order of a centimeter squared per gram um, in optical light. Whereas like in between um, at say 3000 Kelvin where you have mostly uh, atomic hydrogen it can be 10 to the minus three. So this is a really significant increase in the opacity. Um, so here's one example of a system that is uh, a solar mass, 30 solar radii donor star, mass ratio of one third. Um, as mass transfer uh, brings this system together, the orbital period decreases. The mass loss rate to the circumbinary environment increases from something like 10 to the minus five solar masses per year to uh, 0.1 solar masses per year. And then what I do is I calculate the um, optical depth of dust in that material, just by saying that everything below 1,000 Kelvin forms some dust. And it, uh, and then I sort of integrate from the outside in and just calculate the optical depth. And that's uh, because of the seep density profile of these profiles, it's always dominated by the region, the innermost region that has dust. So. Um, the sort of warm dust is most important in that. And all I want to show you in this plot is that from way before the merger, there, uh, the system is relatively unobscured. And then as you go towards them merging, it becomes more and more and more obscured. And, um, and so what that might mean is that if you start with an object like this, uh, it might start out as like an optically very bright progenitor system. A 30 solar radius, one solar mass star is uh, hundreds of solar luminosities. And so you might have a very bright giant, but just before it merges, this system would have four or five magnitudes of extinction um, in the optical. And so it would have been decreasing in optical brightness sort of leading into this phase. And we can kind of map out that parameter space a little bit. And what I think is interesting is that it depends a lot on the properties of the uh, merging system, and in particular, how compact it is. So um, for very extended giant stars of hundreds of solar radii that are relatively low mass, you might form a lot of dust in those outflows. And equivalently, what that means is that those outflows are cold. Um, and uh, for relatively massive stars, uh, the, the sort of typical V-band obscuration is really low. Um, these, this sort of population of diamonds is the luminous red novae uh, that I showed you before. And so what is interesting to see here is that their progenitors all lie in regions where the predicted uh, uh, V-band sort of dust obscuration is less than about one magnitude between 0.1 and one. And so uh, I think that's an indication that everything that we've seen both so far, these optical transients are kind of the unobscured population of transients. Um, and in the context of an HR diagram, we see kind of similar things, um, but it lets us also notice that, you know, uh, the population of objects that we've seen are these um, essentially yellow giants. They're objects that have evolved away from the main sequence uh, in large part. Um, and, uh, but they're not basically at the tip of their respective giant branches. Um, and so uh, we have every expectation that uh, binary stars come in a wide range of separations. There should be just as many sort of merger events here as here. And it must just be that we're tracing so far the unobscured population. Um, 
Okay, so this looks like I just flipped the plot around, but actually the x-axis is different. So let me walk you through that. Um, <laughs> so uh, here I'm plotting gm squared over r. So this is something like the binding energy of that primary star. And the very simplest model for how common envelope ejection might or might not work is that the net change in orbital energy, if that's equal to or greater than the binding energy of that envelope, maybe you have enough energy budget to uh, cast it off and, and eject it. And so what I think we're seeing here is that the low obscuration population of optical transients that tr that's traced by the luminous red novae um, seems to be objects with relatively high binding energies on this plot in the sense that they're not in the sense of the normalization of this number, but in the sense that they're all on the right-hand side. <laughs> um, and then the left-hand side is things with comparatively lower binding energies. So those are the objects that we would predict might be more successful in expelling their envelope if they were to have an equivalent interaction. And all of those have predicted sort of higher levels of dust, dustiness, dust obscuration. So what I think that means is that transients that are associated with say common envelope ejection will tend to be in this kind of dusty world and things that are associated with stellar merger outcomes might be in this kind of optical transient um, uh, space. And we think that these things that are more dust obscured, that light will emerge in the infrared instead of in the optical, basically. Um, if you do one last exercise, which is to weight the separation distribution of binaries, by like a power law, like there's equal number of binaries per log separation. Uh, that's kind of the simplest uh, version of that. Um, that's not quite correct, but it is broadly correct. Um, then you find that sort of on the order of half of one solar mass sort of stellar coalescences will be in this infrared phase space and half will be in the optical. By the time you get up to about eight solar masses, almost everything is in the optical. And that basically just has to do with the faster velocities and higher temperatures associated with those um, uh, kind of like faster, uh, hotter ejecta that, that don't tend to form much dust. So along those lines, there's one kind of weird object uh, that, or very weird object that was discovered by Ogle again. This was thought to be a microlensing source at first. Um, it uh, has kind of a extended maybe about a thousand day brightening by about five magnitudes. Um, later, uh, there was a publication that suggested it might be associated with a stellar merger based on uh, sort of some broad similarities of this like progressive brightening, but I think that we don't know basically. Um, but if we look a little bit more closely at the SED during these different phases, and this is a paper, um, don't know if I typed in the reference on the next slide, but it's by Tylinda in uh, 2013. Um, so uh, what we see is that, um, the spectral energy distribution is really biased towards the infrared in these early phases, but some optical light is still emerging. I'm sure you can't read this axis, but this is basically uh, one micron and this is optical over here. Um, and so that's uh, equivalent to about three magnitudes of optical extinction. Um, after this drop off, their, their AV was about eight and a half. And basically the source disappears back here and um, the limits on uh, the optical flux are that AB was more than 20 magnitudes. And so what I think we must be seeing here is that this uh, system is becoming progressively more and more dust obscured. If it is kind of of this stellar merger class, basically we might be seeing a pair that's kind of spiraling slowly together. 
and becoming more and more dusty. And, and maybe this is kind of one of these uh, intermediate class objects that's like partially obscured by dust, but still has some optical light coming out. Unfortunately, we don't really know. Um, basically, we don't know the distance to this object. We don't have spectra and it's already over. Um, so uh, there's a few counts against us, but um, uh, this might be the right sort of qualitative features, but I think we'll have to kind of look forward to new, uh, new sources. So just to kind of summarize, I think something that we're learning from both modeling these phases and from uh, observing them is that mass transfer and then loss to the circumbinary environment is both this element that drives the systems closer together and it shapes their appearance. And uh, along those lines, dust formation in those outflows might be an important uh, element of producing infrared transients to go along with the sort of population of optical transients that we've already discovered. Um, in the broadest sense, I kind of like to think about this as like a timeline of a stellar merger or a common envelope phase. And so you maybe start with a binary system and there's some phase as they're progressively coming closer together, maybe there's a really dramatic outburst as they merge, dust forms, there's a remnant. Some of these systems have been observed by Alma. They have amazing bipolar morphologies. Um, and then as that gas continues to disperse, maybe there's a hot remnant left in the center that ionizes a nebula around it. Um, there are uh, planetary nebula with binary centers. Um, and uh, I think all of these phenomena we've known for years are related, but I think by seeing them in action, uh, as we said at the very beginning of the talk, we actually kind of, are starting to connect these dots in um, a more and more conclusive way. Um, so we had a sense that this might be a timeline, but I think we're learning that more and more clearly by watching. So this for piece of data, for example, is an object that we saw go through its outburst. Um, and now we have ALMA data 25 years later. And so uh, we're starting to see individual objects make transitions in this in this phase space, and that's proving really helpful in linking up this timeline. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for having me here. It's just such a delight to be able to be here in person. Um, and I'll be excited to hear your questions. Yes. Plenty of time for questions, so uh, I'll try to watch online. If okay. anybody has questions, feel free to, to type it into the chat. But if you guys have any questions, um, please raise your hand. Or... Okay, Anna, go ahead. I have questions. Yeah. <laughs> Anna always has questions. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I have a question about like the, the end stage. It's, yeah. It looks like there are like a couple of plus, there's a sort of a, uh, a glitch in that exponential behavior. Yeah. If you look in the main ethyl phase and the main yeah. uh, in the life curve, like the human life curve. Yeah. So, like, is there like something different? Maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I think the behavior in that phase has to do with your kind of the mass loss rate to the environment is exponentially increasing. The temperature is also changing because the velocity of those ejecta are also changing. And so um, it ends up being the case that sort of the colors are changing. Um, in some of these data, you only have one band. So it can be diff diff difficult to disentangle whether some of those are band effects or real. Um, and the other thing that's maybe changing is that um, you can have like the leading edge of the ejecta starting to reach the dust formation radius. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of increasing obscuration. And in all of these optical events, what seems to truncate the optical light curve at the end is like this sort of bulk dust formation episode and they become infrared sources. And so I think those glitches, I mean, there's something there. 
Well, like you can see one right here where there's a little mini plateau and then it increases again. I don't know what we're seeing yet. There's so, basically we haven't been able to disentangle it. Um, I think if you had good multicolor photometry there, you could say it more conclusively, but this is almost always uh, patched together after the fact from sort of the archive. And so it's actually pretty rare to have like simultaneous multicolor coverage with good cadence and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah. So, so Josh had a question about the geometry of the ejecta and, you know, you could potentially have large changes in AV from things like holes in the ejecta, in the torus. Can you distinct, you know, is there ways to distinguish between an actual outburst and maybe something that looks like an outburst because, you know, maybe you're seeing through the dust at one point and not at other points. Well, yeah, that's a really good question. And basically I haven't thought about that at all yet. Um, and uh, all of the AVs that I was showing you are through the equator of the torus. Yes. So like, I was going to say worst case, but like <laughs> worst if you dislike dust obscuration. So and that puts a weird value judgment on it all. But um, the most obscured can line of sight. Um, whereas if you like, in theory, if you look down on the pole, it might be completely evacuated. In practice, probably it wouldn't be uh so clean but but basically uh some of this could be viewing angle dependent um i mean in principle you have 3d simulation and also temporal yeah so you could have different sight lines yep. through them and actually evaluate yep. this more yeah yeah, yeah exactly and and i think the thing that might be really interesting to do with that uh 3d information is to look at the time variation and so basically I took the 3D models as inspiration for just like a power law slope that was spherically symmetric. But what you could equally do is like take the time, take sort of that movie that I showed you and sit an observer at an arbitrary angle and ask what they would see. And that's a really beautiful point. Um, yeah. So a question I had was about the rates and how much you thought about the rates. And one of the things that has always impressed me about these events and I don't know if it's been appreciated by the wider community is a lot has happened in our galaxy in the last couple of decades, which implies that a significant fraction of the stars that we just have in our galaxy are actually merger remnants. Yeah. And now you're saying that maybe we're missing half of these also because they're all extinguished. So yeah. It seems like this is very common phenomenon. Have you thought about, for example, connecting this to binary populations and you know, what we know about binaries and also actually thinking about what are the actual rates of these, of these events. Yeah, so it's, it's a great point. And I think there's two ways to think about the, well, there's at least two ways to think about the rates. One way is that um, if you integrate over the lifetime of a star of different, of, of given mass, mm -hmm. what is the likelihood that it goes through a phase like this? And at one solar mass, that's about 10% chance. Yep. Um, and uh, at 10 solar masses, that's more than a 50% chance. So I think there you start to get into a phase space where these modifications are really common to yeah. stars. And actually, for example, um, if you, this is kind of a simple, I, I, I don't know that this is a really deep statement, but um, if you say you want to make a 20 solar mass star, you can ask, is it more common to add 10 plus 10 yeah. or start with 120 solar mass? And it's a sort of function of the IMF and the relative likelihood of having two close stars. And I think it's actually of the same order of magnitude to assemble a 20 solar mass star by merging two lighter stars. So basically, um, the IMF, the slope of the IMF tells you that if you double the mass, it's five times less likely. Yeah. And sort of on that order, maybe one fifth of massive stars merge on the main sequence. Yeah, um, but even like one tenth of all solar like stars are actually merger remnants. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty wild. Crazy. And so then if you transform that to uh, like instantaneous rate in the galaxy, you get something like one per year in, in a get Milky Way like galaxy. And we've been seeing, uh, uh, 
one every five years, maybe. Yeah, um, so it's not crazy that we would miss some because there's a lot of areas of the galactic plane that are opaque to us, but um, yeah. So, so there's a lot of, there's a few more questions that people are excited. Um, so Lynn Halebrandt is asking about, have you thought about pre-main sequence mergers? And in particular, she's motivated because there have been outbursts from uh, some young solar systems that don't seem like they're from the normal disk-driven outbursts. Yeah. So maybe this would be an explanation. So the object V838 Monoceros, the one with the amazing HST light echo, um, we don't have great constraints on exactly where that was in its evolution, but it was either early main sequence or maybe even sort of slightly pre-main sequence. That system was part of a triple. Um, maybe the tertiary was involved in driving them towards the merger. It was in a hierarchical triple system. Um, I think I haven't thought about it in detail, but uh, you know, it should also happen. I think the thing that the simplest view that I've had about why this happens is that solar evolution sets you up with this situation where you have some fixed binary separation and the radius of one of the stars is growing. Yeah. And so they're on this sort of course to interaction. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that you can't have orbits that are being reconfigured by all the surrounding stars in a like star cluster, yeah, star young star cluster or dense stellar environment that puts you in that situation. And so I think you need some external influence on the orbit mm -hmm. because I think I think of a pre-main sequence star as usually having like a monotonically decreasing radius, yeah. but, um, but that's not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, and we might kind of, be inclined to associate it with other things because there's so much variability in those sources in the first place. Um, and then one more question, Andy McWilliams asks, when you're considering you know, digging into the star when they're starting to merge, do you think about the actual composition of material? So for example, if you start ejecting um, carbon rich material that had undergone triple alpha, now you have more opportunities to make dust depending on the composition of the material of changing. Oh, that's an amazing point. I have not thought about that at all. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, an amazing set of ALMA observations um, and SMA observations of uh, a 1670 outburst of uh, what was thought to be a nova at the time, um, an object uh, CK vol. Um, and uh, that object has just, so you can measure uh, lots of different isotopes and their ratios and that sort of thing. And so um, in those ejecta, you have indications of nucleosynthetic products that are like from the CNO cycle. And so the thought is from whatever they came from, they had to come relatively deep within the object that caused that yeah. outburst. And we don't really know if that was a classical novae or a, merger, um, it had this sort of, um, there's actually a historic light curve. And so you, you um, it's not just a single rise and decay, it's like a rise and then hundreds of days later, another rise and decay. Um, uh, so that's that's a case where we're only seeing after the fact, but, but that must happen. And it must be that as you carve deeper into the star, there's sort of like, yeah. um, I think like at least you could post process you know, something and be able to follow particles or something. Yeah. Like you have a scalar that follows the composition. No, that's a great point. So I actually just did some of the technical details to be able to like put, say, like an onion shell of different scalar tracers. And yeah. so I could basically, uh, if we imagine, say, like certain products and certain elements being in like a burning shell out, in, outside the core, I could like tag those layers and watch where they go spatially. Um, because I don't know if those later fast ejecta, some of them get redirected towards the poles basically because they run into this torus mm -hmm. um, and they basically just get hydrodynamically redirected toward the zone of free escape. Um, so it'd be interesting to follow that over a longer time and see where they go. Um, any, any last questions in the audience? Everyone's good? All right, well, thank you. Thank um, you all. Thank you, I'm so grateful. All right.
And thanks right. to folks online. Yeah. Bye, everyone.